I'll see about that. In any case, um, instead of doing a kind of health lecture for our time together today, um, I want to spend some time having you ponder the marvel of God's creating your bodies and mine and the universe for that matter. And I'm going to do it with uh, studying the uh, marvel of the human eye. But still it's not on the screen. That's correct. If not with your voice. Um, 
So let, let me talk about those for a few minutes with you. But let me also finish this statement. He says the idea that these features could have been formed by natural selection. Seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Now, I realize that most of you have heard this term, natural selection. I'm not sure how many of you could define it or explain it to somebody, but I'm going to try to take a minute to do that. Uh, one lady said to me a while ago, she said, I don't, I don't do science. Um, and I hope none of you have that attitude this morning. I'm going to try to make this understandable. I don't think I need this, is that correct? It's kind of way here. Um, so take a couple of minutes with me. I want you to understand the concept of natural selection. It's the evolutionary mechanism that evolutionists believe brought about you and me. So let me take a look here for just a few moments at this idea. And what Darwin is saying is, I agree that, that thinking that just the I could have done this is absurd. It's interesting that this evolutionist says, this is absurd. But uh, let me have you think with me for a minute now. This Newsweek magazine was published 15 years ago. And down the middle of the page is a ladder, I'm going to call it that, it's twisted in the opposite direction, top and bottom. I think most of you in this room, perhaps with the exception of the children, and some of you that are as old as I am and you forget things, uh, know that this is a, a drawing, if you will, of what we call DNA. Am I correct on that? I'm watching your faces. Some of you are talking to each other instead of nodding. Um, how many uh, are familiar with this idea? Let me see your hands. Okay, just about right In case you are one that isn't, um, the genetics, the genes inside the cells of our bodies are pieces of this ladder. And uh, it's been years ago now that a couple of scientists figured out that there was a ladder and that it was twisted, if you will, and it, I think all of you have heard that term. And um, the reason that uh, granddaughter on the left looks a lot like grandma on the right is because they have uh, genes that are quite similar. You all know about that, I'm sure. Now I've made the arrow point to what I'm going to call a rung. It's a little bit like the ladder in your garage, which is not twisted. It has rungs, am I right? Uh, in the case of DNA, this long, this long ladder, how many rungs are in that ladder? Can you read the number? Three billion plus some more, two hundred million. That's a pretty long ladder. Well, it's, at least it's got a lot of rungs, doesn't it? Y'all with me? All right. And uh, unlike the ladder in your garage, I'm going to see how close I can get before we get feedback. Unlike the ladder in your garage, where the rungs are all the same, in the DNA, there's four kinds of rungs. A lot of you know about that. Some of you wouldn't. And uh, let me ask a question here. Getting to that, would you agree with me that these two words have the same letters? Everybody? Some of you are still talking to each other instead of answering my question. <laughs> what makes the difference as you read these two words? Somebody said the letters are in a different order. That's the exact correct answer. Now, actually, uh, a scientist would, would rather have you use another word. It's not important, but the scientist likes to use, like to use, like to use the word what? Sequence. Sequence. And 
Um, unlike the ladder in your garage, where the rungs in the ladder are all the same. Are you all with me on that? In the DNA, there's four kinds of rungs. You can think of maybe four different colors. They're not colored, but just for the sake of thinking, there's four different kinds. And uh, if your ladder was like that in your garage and you closed your eyes, maybe you could tell the difference in the rungs by feeling them or something. But at least in, in, the, in the DNA, that's the case. So I'm going to put some letters on them. Let me just pick four letters. Uh, because I've told you already, how many different kinds of rungs are there in this? Four kinds. And actually, those rungs are chemicals. Chemicals have names. And we usually use the first letter of the chemical uh, to mark the rungs. These aren't the ones, but I, I just picked A, B, C, D at random. And uh, if one of these rungs, and let me back up and just make sure you understand that a gene is, is a piece of the ladder. The gene might start here and end there. And then another gene will start somewhere else and end somewhere else. So, um, and the gene makes the color of your eye. You all understand that we are what we are because of the genes. Is that correct? And uh, I'm trying to simplify this as much as possible so there's a lot more infinite more one can say about these things. But nevertheless, if one of these rungs accidentally became another one, did you see it disappear for a second? What was there before? A C. And if it became a different rung, then the gene would be different. Would that make sense to you? It's the order of the rungs that has the information. Is that clear to you? Like a word, it's the order of the, that gives you the information. It's the order of the rungs that makes your hair brown, makes you get bald when you're older, or whatever. Are y'all with me? And if the rung that controls the different things in your body became the wrong one, which happened just now. Is that correct? Y'all with me in this? That does happen. It happens all the time. I'll take a moment on that in a moment. But the gene would now have a mistake. We have a special word for that. How many of you know what the word is? Just for fun? We call it a mutation. It's a word you know that word now that I use it. Uh, it happens, folks, that uh, when you cut yourself, let's say, and then it heals, it heals because the cells nearby copy themselves and just make it all good again. Is that correct? And inside of every cell in your body, with the exception of the red blood cells, there's always an exception. Almost always an exception. Inside of every cell is that ladder with how many rungs in it? Three million plus. Are y'all with me still? Every cell. Here's the problem, folks. You and I all started from one cell. Is that correct? And that cell had to copy itself. And copy, and copy. And then the cells started to differentiate, is the word we use. Any one of those cells could become any organ in your body. Are you aware of that? Not nodding real beers. <laughs> We call it a stem cell. You know about that, don't you? And uh, you and I became us as those stem cells copy. And listen to this. Every time a cell copies itself, whether it's from a cut or making you become a little baby from a cell, every cell that is copied also has to have a DNA copy in it. Is that correct? So when this cell is going to make a new one, among other things, it has to make all the stuff that's going to be in that new cell. Among that is a whole copy of the ladder. Is that correct? Y'all with me? Please nod. Y'all with me? All right. If you sit there and don't nod, folks, it makes me feel like a teacher that I didn't do a very good job. Now, if you nod and you don't understand, then that's bad. 
if you'll do this, it will tell me that I need to do a little more on that. Okay. Listen carefully. The average number of mistakes, and there are always mistakes. There is no exception to that. Do you know that? The DNA in that first cell, in that first copy, has about a thousand mistakes in it. It actually started with about three million mistakes. But God has designed a bunch of proteins in our bodies that travel along with the new DNA. Are you still with me? And fix the mistakes. This is astonishing beyond belief. These are not living things. They're just protein, little pieces of pro little protein pieces that travel along the ladder and fix the rungs. But they miss a few. There's a book written recently, very interesting book, none of you would want to read it. <laughs> called Genetic Entropy, written by a Nobel laureate. You know what I'm talking about? This man received a Nobel Prize for his clinical work. And he shows in that book that without these DNA fixers, the whole human race would die from cancer within 40 years. Amazing. Now when I get to heaven, I'm going to biology class. <laughs> you know, there's lots of questions we might have today for biology teachers that they, what will they have to say? I don't know. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, what we know is tiny in comparison to what there is to know. So I don't understand why God didn't make us, in fact, I think originally he did, so that there was errors in the DNA that would all get fixed. But that is not the case, folks. So all through your body, cells everywhere have been mutated to more or lesser and uh, that causes all kinds of problems. Uh, sometimes the mutation is unremarkable. It didn't cause any problems. But in any case, here's what natural selection is. We did that whole five minutes. Just I want you to understand what Darwin is saying when he says uh, that the eye could have formed by natural selection. Here's what he means. And I realize some of you know this, so forgive me if you're already a student on this question. Natural selection says that that mistake that got fixed, I mean, I'm sorry, that that mistake that was made right there, that accidental mistake, if you will, will make the organism, let's say the person, the little baby that grew into a person, or maybe an animal uh, that from a baby became an adult an animal. Natural selection says that that accidental change would make the animal more likely to survive. So it's called survival of the fittest. Are y'all with me on that? So natural selection says by accident mutations cause the offspring to have some kind of an advantage or to be better off. Y'all with me on that? It's absurd. Uh, I think you all know, folks, that evolutionists today, which are most scientists, believe that somehow a cell by itself just got created, not, I'm sorry, not created, it just formed in some chemical soup somewhere in the universe. But once that cell was formed with DNA, which itself is an absurd thing to ever imagine, scientists have absolutely no idea how that could happen. There are some scientists that will write articles like, oh, this and that and the other, but if you pin them down, they will say, we have no idea how this could happen. But they all believe that it happened. And then, watch this now, that natural selection made that cell become a toad, or made that cell become a uh, a bird 
And they believe that every living creature on the face of the earth occurred because of natural selection. Are you all with me? Accidents in the ladder. It is absurd. But uh, if you don't want to, and I apologize to those of you that are evolutionists. I love you either way. But uh, even Darwin said it was what? Absurd. absurd. Darwin himself said that. Okay. So I hope you get the idea that uh, when he said that the eye could do these things by natural selection is what? What did he say it was? Absurd. Absurd. So let's take a look at how the eye works. Here is uh, some light that comes in. Now, actually, the cornea bends the light as well. We'll just pretend like it's just the lens. The light focuses on the retina, and that's kind of how it works. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the retina is not just at the back of the eye. It virtually covers the entire inside of the eye. And there are 11 layers of cells in that retina. And it's about the thickness of saran wrap. <laughs> How many layers? Eleven. Amazing. Eleven layers. And um, the artist has drawn a little kind of a rectangle there and expanded it uh, with that diagram to the right. I'm going to make that full screen, that picture right there. And then I want you to see a couple of things. Starting at the left is the surface that uh, the buttoning is at the back of your eye, and then clear at the back of the retina is the eleventh layer of cells, if you wish. And here comes some light, and it has to get down to where and the artist has colored them. They're not colored. He's done that, or she's done that, just for a little bit of clarity. I think most everybody in this room knows that somehow in the back of your eye there are rods and cones. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Say yes? Yes. yes. Uh, if you didn't know it before, you know it now. <laughs> most of you know, even your children could, could probably answer this. Uh, the rod, the little thing that looks like a, just a plain rod, only sees what kind of light? Black or white? Y'all with me on that? You're not nodding. For how many of you is that brand new knowledge? Let me see your hands. Oh, interesting. Um, but now you know it. And the cone-shaped things, by the way, these are nerve cells. The rod is a nerve cell. We call it a neuron. A neuron. And so is the cone. They are shaped differently. I'll show you a picture of them in a few minutes. Uh, the cones, can detect color. And so the artist has pictured how many color detect how many types of color detectors? There's a red one, there's a blue one, there's a green one. Most of you know, you ought to do this with your children as you're having. Get a strong magnifying glass and go up to the screen of that big flat screen TV you have in your house. And if you if you magnify it enough, you'll see a little tiny dot call it a pixel, that actually has three colors, are red, green, and blue. And when you back away from it, the electronics makes, makes pictures for you. You and I watch it, we never think twice about that, do we? But uh, the eye, in a certain sense, does the same thing. Those, those are not colored, but uh, uh, artists are done. There's a rod. There's the, some of the layers of the cell of the uh, retina. Now that last blue arrow that I stuck up there, right here, is pointing at what Darwin is going to call the what? Actually, another evolutionist is going to call the wires. Um, you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that these rods and cones make electric signals that have to somehow travel the brain. And all of these wires come together in a bundle here. You see where I'm pointing with the bundle? Y'all with me on that? I like a dim for a gone too long. 
So here comes all these wires um, that are the signal that the eye sees to the brain. There it is, on its way to the brain. So that's kind of the idea of uh, a real simplified idea of the retina. There's your flat screen with 8 million dots. Uh, big 4K screen. 8 million of those little tiny dots. In the eye, there are 150 million rods and cones in just one little spot back there. Are you all with me on this? You're not nodding. How many of you have I lost? Let me see your hand. How many should have raised their hands in there? <laughs> we got one on the soul back here. I saw one. Could you, could you ask, I'm trying to look around the lake. Could you ask a question that would help me clarify something that I didn't make clear by any chance? Could you give me a question? Just keep going on. <laughs> I don't want anybody to be lost. Uh, in either kind of uh, situation. So, uh, 150 million. That's amazing, folks, isn't it? Back there in this little tiny space uh, inside your eyeball. And there's the wires from all of those that have to travel to the brain. There's something very interesting. Instead of 150 million wires, it has been reduced. How many? Only a million. That's what you have all heard called the optic nerve. It's a misnomer. You all with me? It is a bundle of how many nerves? One million that leave the eye and head back to the brain so that you can see what you're seeing right now. Now let me show you the problems that Darwin referred to, the spherical aberration and the chromatic. Chromatic is a fancy word for color. So something happens to color and um, um, because the eyeball, the, eye should be, the image should be unfocused. I'm going to use a telescope instead of a lens because it's a little easier to same idea. So here's a telescope, and uh, the light comes from the stars and hits the mirror. And because the mirror is curved, the light is bent back, or if you will, is going to be focused. And there's usually a little mirror in there so your eye can see it. Y'all got that? How this telescope works? Um, and um, if that mirror was the shape of a circle or a ball, as, it, it, as, it, as the lens would be in your eye, that was a mirror. Let me show you what happens. If that was a circle, let me show you what happens. The, the light rays from the edge will focus here. And the light rays that are closer to the middle will focus here. I'm just telling you, that's what would happen if the mirror was a what? A circle shape. A portion of a circle, y'all with me? What would that do to the image that you're looking at? It would be blurry because the focusing is in different places. Are y'all with me on that? So that's what he, that's what Darwin was talking about. Um, spherical aberration. It's amazing to me that he understood this back in the day when science was in its infancy. Are you all with me on that? And uh, because it's focusing in different places, it would be blurry. Now, um, here's a man playing basketball. And he's going to toss this... Um, basketball into the air and hope it goes through the hoop, right? Now because gravity operates like it does, the moment he lets go of that ball, it's going to follow a certain pathway that, I'm not going to tell you the name of it, but it's 
no matter no matter what you throw or drop, just kind of half toss. Once it leaves your hands, it follows this interesting pathway because of the way gravity works. Newton actually figured out the equation. You could put this equation in your spreadsheet on your computer if you know how to do it and make it draw that line. Y'all with me on this? It just, just, just draw something. And it's actually, it's actually following that line. Are y'all with me? He wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so, uh, this is the shape. Uh, now, the basketball guy was using maybe, oh, that portion right there. Y'all with me? And if you just drop something in somebody's lap, it would be using maybe that portion there. Y'all follow me? No matter what you drop, except for air friction, like on a feather, it's going to follow that path. And uh, interestingly enough, scientists figured out that uh, if you made a mirror that shape, let me show you what I mean, just the very tip of this thing, if you make a mirror that shape, it focuses the light properly. So instead of a circle, it's this other shape. Are you all with me on the idea? It's amazing to me, again, that Darwin in that early world of science understood these things. So, um, here is a diagram of what happens. Whether the rays are from the outside or whether they come in near the middle, they focus. I, I took that picture way just a little too fast, so let's do it again. So, the rays, whether they're on the edge or It'll, it'll all come to focus and you'll have a nice sharp image. This is a picture up until about 20 years ago. This was the largest mirror that ever had been made. 17 feet in diameter. And the surface of that mirror is not a circle. What is it? It's this other thing, right? And this is the, uh, the telescope on Mount Palomar. Anybody ever visited that place? Not a soul. Okay, one, one, one hand. <laughs> anyway, um, so that, that's the spherical problem. The eye is a sphere, and so Darwin was a. Listen, let me repeat. Darwin was aware, folks, that the eye could correct for that problem. Y'all with me? And I'll show you how how that is. He, he had no idea how it did. He just knew that it did. Then he thought to himself, Wow. That would be pretty hard for natural selection to do, but it did it. Now, uh, what about the color problem? Everybody knows this. Even the little kids in this room probably have had their teacher hold up a piece of glass, that, like a triangle, and shine some light. And what happens to the white light that goes through the two sides of that? Thing? Yeah. Newton was the first one who figured out that white light was actually a bunch of colors all at the same time. Y'all with me on that, aren't you? And uh, so the prism separates the white light because some colors bend more than others. Are y'all with me on that? That's why the colors separate as they pass through that uh, from one side to the other. Now, I think you would agree with me that a lens like in a camera, like in your iPhone or your other type of phones. Uh, isn't that the shape of a prism? Please say yes. <laughs> yes. Worry me, folks. Have I lost you that bad? Is the top of that lens got a triangular shape? Yes. Is that a prism shape? Yes. So when the light hits that lens, what's it, what's it going to do? It's going to become unfocused, right? As it tries to focus it, correct? Get the idea? And um, Darwin understood this. He realized that the lens in the eye was making a blurry image. But somehow, the eye figured out how to fix the blurry image. That's the chromatic problem. Y'all with me on this? And he believed that natural selection made this happen. He had no idea how it was actually functioning. And, uh, you know, if you put your retina there, you'd see blue, but you, green and red would be out of focus. So you would, it would be a blurry image, right? You guys have gotten out of nodding. 
that the Father put the bottom line? I don't, I don't want to be, browbeat you too much, folks, but you've got to talk to me with your face. And if I ask you if it's clear, don't sit there and not tell me that it's Okay. So, um, and he said, I realize, I realize it's absurd, but it had to happen. Very interesting. Now, in your camera, uh, scientists have figured out, you can't see this very well, I'm sorry, that is too bad. Uh, the image is so bright, it's taking away the lines. I was going to show you how in your iPhone, or in your nice single uh, lens reflex camera, there's one, there's one lens shape like this, and then out of a different kind of glass, there's another lens shape like this, and using the different kind of glass, and the convex and the concave lens, you can actually make an image in the camera that's focused. That's how the cameras work. But God did not use that method. Now here's probably the most famous evolutionist in today's world, is a man named Richard Dawkins. How many have ever heard the name of you see your hands? All right. And you've heard it now. <laughs> He's a kind of an arrogant guy. Very, very smart. Very talented. And uh, a great exponent against the idea of a God who created things. And in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, this is what he said. Any engineer would naturally assume that the rods and the cones would point towards the light with their wires leading back to the brain. You understand what Dawkins is saying? The rods and the cones should point toward the light and the wires go to the brain. Y'all with me? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> he would laugh, this engineer, at a suggestion that the photocells or the rods and the cones would point what? Away. away from the light with the wires going in the way of the light. Now let me tell you, make sure you get Doc, uh, Dawkins' point. He is saying that if there was a creator, he would never have designed the eye like this. <laughs> Any engineer would know better. Y'all with me on that? That's what he's saying. So he's using it as an argument to say, so see, evolution did it, didn't do it as good as it could, but it got it done. Do you understand his argument? Yet this is exactly what happens. So let me show you what he's talking about. And again, this light is so bright, it's taking away some of the stuff I'd like you to see. But here comes the light. Uh, here are the photoreceptors pointing what direction? Away from the light. Are you all with me on this? In fact, if you had the remote for this projector, you could probably adjust the contrast and make some of these things get better. Um, I don't know that we should cut the photo too much. That helps a little. But uh, not, not to worry too much. But I wish you could see the picture on my screen instead of the one on the big screen. But uh, he, he's going to play with it a little bit. We'll see. So um, here's what you can't see very well in this diagram. All of the wires are coming in a bundle right here. Are you all with me? How many wires is that? One million. Now, they're not wires made out of copper chains. We're using this wire as kind of a metaphor. It's actually a nerve cell. So there's a hundred nerves, a million nerve cells in a bundle coming back to the brain. Y'all still with me, correct? And Darwin's point is those wires are going to mess up the light trying to get to the brain. Are y'all with me on that? That's his argument. They see, there wasn't a creator that did this, it was by accident. 
Okay. Wires are in front of the light, as if you will, right there. Okay. Um, now let me take just uh, 30 seconds to tell you, remind you of something you know. Everybody has seen uh, and knows about what we call fiber optic cables, correct? You see the ditch which figures out there bearing these big rolls of uh, fiber optic and there are probably three to five hundred little tiny plastic, almost the size of a human hair, uh, light, light, a little plastic thing that can transmit light. Um, and I just used a little diagram here. If you take one of those little pieces of plastic and shine some light on the end, it just travels, it just travels right down through it. It can travel for miles and come out the other end. And in fact, even if it didn't get in there straight, there's a very interesting thing I will try to describe for you, or explain it, except to say that the light never leaks out. It just keeps bouncing back and forth and finally does what? Comes out the other end. Even if the, even if the cable is curved, and of course it is, when you put it underground, it's making some bends and so forth. It doesn't matter, the light once it gets inside, it stays inside. It's quite remarkable. That's what man has developed. Uh, in the human eye, uh, there is something, interestingly enough, sort of similar. Uh, I'm just showing you again the parts there. And, uh, here's what we have only known for a few years. Now, this is a drawing by an artist that's very simplified. There's 11 layers of cells in there. And what we did not know until very recently, in fact, the scientist who discovered it, his name is Mueller. And so this yellow cell is a nerve cell. Uh, is called a Mueller cell. And it's actually like a fiber optic. It takes the light and lets in and it travels through all it travels through all of these layers of wires. And it was here I can point to it. Wires and cells all over the place. But the Mueller cell catches the light and carries it like an optic fiber clear down to where the rods and the cones are. Got that? Is that cool? <laughs> and interestingly enough. Watch this. The Mueller cell, you can't see the blue very well. Maybe I think there's that part they cut of mine. Can you see the blue one right here? The tip of that Mueller cell is just wide enough to catch the unfocused colors and bring them back to you. Got that? We had no idea about how this was happening until very recently. And when your optometrist puts your chin on that thing and shines that bright light in there and looks at your retina, I would, and this is not quite the right word to use, but all they're looking at is Mueller cells. In other words, the Mueller cells are ubiquitous back there. They're just everywhere. So that no matter where the light lands in the retina, the focusing of the colors is, take, is taken care of. Y'all with me? Plus, it takes the light through all those layers of cells and gets it back there so you can. You never thought of any of this this morning when you opened your eyes, did you? <laughs> all right. Now, this is an actual photograph magnified about five million times. Can you see some of these uh, photoreceptors that look like rods? Do some look like cones? Yeah, actual photograph. And um, that's a rock. Here's a cone. So forth. Now, again, I'm sorry about the contrast here. I guess we should have done some checking ahead of time. I think if you just turn down the brightness control, uh, whoever was working on that, it might help. 
But what we have on the left side here is a rod. There should be a line. You can kind of see the line. And uh, the rod goes on down. And what, what you probably can see is there's a, there's a, a series of, I'm going to call them pancakes there. Can you see that? Yeah. Here's what's going on. The pancake, they have a fancy name here, um, has chemicals in it that when light strikes those chemicals, a reaction occurs. A chemical reaction, which causes electricity, causes little pieces of electricity to flow or to move. And so that's a signal. That's how, that's how the rod or the cone works. Here's the problem. That chemical reaction, and all chemical reactions do this, all chemical reactions either make heat or make cold. Very few make cold. Most of them make heat. And what happens is that heat is hot enough to ruin the pancake. You don't seem too concerned about that. <laughs> Got to care about it. <laughs> Not to worry, there's another pancake underneath. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Can you see the pancakes on the on the cone as well? Talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see that. Okay. And uh, all of you know about this idea. Uh, probably most of you have not had it happen. But how many of you have heard about snow blindness? Come on, everybody raise your hand. A couple of minutes ago, I asked you to. <laughs> you know, you go outside in the snow or you're skiing or whatever. Today we use these wonderful light goggles that help that not to happen. But if you're out in the bright, bright snow all day long, what might happen at the end of the day? Your vision is cloudy. How many in this room have ever had snow blindness? Can I see your hands? You know, about a dozen of you. And what has happened, folks, is you have essentially used up all the pancakes on all the rods of cones. Are you all with me on that? There's a few left here and there, so you have this kind of blurry vision. Not to worry, while you sleep tonight, the rods and the cones make more pancakes. Is that, is that remarkable or not? Yes. Just the pancake, folks, is complex beyond belief. And the cell, and it is a nerve cell, but all those rods and cones are nerve cells. But they remanufacture those things. Astonishing. Astonishing. All right. So, um, one last thing. Why did God make the gods and cones point away from the light? Because he had to put a layer of cells there. Can you see those little boxes? There's a name. Names are not important. I'm just trying to think about ideas here. The rods and the cones, you already know, they get hot, but they would absolutely burn up become unfunctional if they weren't in intimate contact with this layer of cells that's full of blood vessels and the blood is rushing through there to take the heat away to save the rods and cones from burning. All with me? I don't know that Richard Dawkins even knows this. Uh, this is astonishing, folks. Uh, Dawkins makes the claim that any engineer would know that this was a poor design. Like a radiator? Pardon me? Like a radiator? Yeah. It's carrying the heat away so that the structure doesn't overheat. Now there's a little bit of overheating because the pancake goes away, but God took care of that too. He got the pancakes working all right. Okay. Now, I won't take long on this part. But uh, at the back of your brain, it's about the size of your hand with your fingers together and cupped. Right there. 
I don't know if you know this, your brain ends right about the top of your eyes here. So this, right back here, occipital lobe, it takes a whole bunch, folks, listen to this, a whole bunch of your brain to process these signals and make the picture that you and I think nothing of all day long. It's that much of the brain to create that thing that we call sight. And just fascinating thing here, I'm just going to take seconds on it. The artist is trying to show you that the optic nerve, these million nerve, this million nerve bundle, that half of them travel to the same side of the brain. See the black and the white? And the other half does what? Travel to the other side of the brain. Make sense? Some very interesting ramifications because of that. And even beyond that is this amazing thing. I think you know this, but let me just make sure. There's about, you, you may not know this, there's about 300 billion nerves, nerve cells in our brains. Not one of them is touching any other nerve cell. Is that correct? All 300 billion of these nerve cells do not touch each other. They communicate with each other. Is that correct? What do we call that space? Several of you are saying it. It's a synapse. Remember that? And that whole world just there is one of the most astonishing things ever. But uh, in fact, the way that one nerve cell communicates with another sort of nerve cell is by sending some chemicals across that little tiny space. We call it the synaptic cleft. Is that right? You know what with that? That space there? It's worrying me, folks. You're not counting. <laughs> How many, be honest with me, have never heard of the synaptic cleft? Let me see your hands. Some children. Two adults. Okay, most of you do. You've all heard of it now. And the signal from one nerve cell to the other nerve cell is accomplished by this nerve cell sending some chemicals across the space. What are those chemicals called? Neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. You can't answer the next question. <laughs> but thank you for answering that one. Everybody in this room, except maybe the children, knows at least one or two chemicals that we call neurotransmitters. Somebody tell me one of them. Huh? Serotonin. 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 Haven't you all heard that word? That's one of the chemicals that the brain uses to send a message from one nerve cell to the next across this little tiny space. Somebody tell me another one that everybody knows about. I'm sorry? Dopamine. Let me tell you something interesting, folks. Today, we know of over 400 chemicals that the brain, the nerve cells use to send the Astonishing. In each case, there's a purpose for the different chemicals. It's just, we are so complex, folks, it is beyond the imagination. And I say this kindly to those of you that are evolutionists. It is observed, I'm going to quote somebody you know about. It is observed to the highest degree to think that this could have happened by chance. We all agree. So there's two synaptic places where these, where the, where the optic nerve, where the bundle of nerves has to cross a gap before it gets back to where the brain starts processing it using more gaps. It's astonishing. Now here's the second, second to the closing story here. This is Dr. Irwin Moon. Years and years ago, he was working with Moody Bible Institute. He's a scientist, and he got to thinking about the desire, especially for young people, but for any of us, to make films, back in those days they were called films, illustrate spiritual truth 
from something physical in the body. And he called these films Sermons from Science. And they were available starting clear back in the early 60s, probably. That's a long time ago. And uh, he ended up doing some, he did things that would interest kids, maybe adults too, but he did things with electricity. And here's one example. He's got some metal circles on his fingers and he's standing on top of a, an electrostatic generator. And uh, he has to turn on the power and suddenly there's these sparks flying everywhere. And of course, kids thought that was agilistic interesting, and so forth. Um, and and he, he, he put together um, about 18 of these. And I used to use them at Upper Columbia Academy in my science classes. Um, certain ones that I thought were not only interesting to the kids, but related to something we were trying to learn. For example, uh, City of the Bees. Um, he showed how the bees come back, people do kind of know this, they come back to the hive, and the way they wiggle themselves tells the rest of the bees where the food is. You wear that? Uh, he had a whole film on that. But of all the, and I, I used to show almost all of these uh, to, uh, sometime in the physics class or whatever. Uh, but the one I liked the most was called Windows of the Soul. And he uh, had his uh, shop build a pair of kind of binocular-like things that uh, when you put them up to your eye, turn the world upside down and left for right. And they built this thing, and here they are, fitting it on him. I actually have a film of them making it, but we don't have time to watch that. And he wanted to know if something as crazy as turning your world upside down would be a problem for the brain to fix. So he wore this thing for six weeks and never opened his eyes when he took it off. He closed his eyes and put on a mask and go to bed or whatever. And uh, here is at the very beginning some simple task uh, where you just roll the ball across the table and he tries to grab it. And because things are left to right and upside down, it was just very, very difficult. And like I said, uh, he closed his eyes and put his mask on. Um, he gave himself a rest from that thing on his head. <laughs> For six weeks, here he is walking down the street. Um, this is what it looked like to him. <laughs> but, but, after enough time went by, he was able to do anything, including, he was a pilot. He went out and flew all the maneuvers that you're required to fly to get your private pilot's license. <laughs> with the world upside down and left to right. And here he is, just before he takes off in the plane, the press is, uh, uh, you know, taking pictures and even interviewing and so forth. Um, now back in 1974, a number of you in this room probably remember there was a World's Fair in Spokane, right? How many of you went there at all? Why is your brother laughing? He's not that old, is he? Was he lying to me just now? That was 1974. And uh, there's a backstory to this I'd love to tell you, but I'm just kidding. The uh, North American Division, for those of you that are visiting, the, uh, 
Adventist Church as a administrative structure. We copied it from the back from the uh, Methodists. They have a conference, uh, which is a region where pastors are hired and paid and so forth. And then there's another structure above it uh, called the Union, which is just a group of those conferences. And there's a structure above that called the Division. So it turns out that all of North America, including Canada, in the Adventist world, are under this North American Division office which helps the other layers with money and helps them with their work and so forth. So the NAD, the North American Division, um, put forth the money to have a display about half the size of this sanctuary on health. And there were all kinds of stations where you could go read something or watch something or listen to something there were things that were there to look at, all kinds of stuff on health, and uh, most of it had electronic parts to it, and I don't know how this happened, but I, I was the electronics teacher at Upper Columbia Academy, and I don't know who did that, but anyway, I was asked to take care of this thing. Uh, so I was given a pass, and when I was done with my classes, or later on when it was open during the summer, I would go in there almost every day and check everything stuff that wasn't working. And uh, that's the building where that display was. And right outside the door was another building in which Moody had, they were playing, guess what? They were playing Irwin Moon's films. And they had about the same size. And it was more like this size, actually. And they actually did have kind of pew-like things. And people would come in there and watch one of these programs. And at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, pew, when the program was over, there was a, a Moody Bible missionary who would turn to the people and say, what did you think? And try to establish some rapport and find out if people were believers in Jesus. Y'all with me on this, aren't you? On this idea. And even though I had seen these films, um, if I had a little extra time, I'd walk across over there and sit down and wait for the next film. <laughs> I'd watch it and then go home. One day I was sitting there, and all of a sudden I happened to see this man walk in uh, with a camera. Uh, hair was white, and he was going around taking pictures for the people of everything. And uh, there was something familiar about this guy. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, ah, that's Erwin Moon. Uh, a few years later, when his hair had become white, I jumped up out of my seat and ran up there and said, Dr. Moon, I'm a physics teacher in a local high school. I use your films. Could we talk? So some of you may remember the Spokane River wasn't very far away, right? Remember that? We went out there and sat down, and um, I wanted to talk to him about this thing he had done. Y'all know what I mean? He misunderstood me at first and thought I was going to do this to all my science students. <laughs> I, I, I said, well, I just, I just want to ask you some questions. So we had a really nice visit about uh, this whole affair. Now, here's what he told me at one point. Uh, well, well, first of all, so I said to him, so what happened? Is the, did, did, did everything kind of just turn right side up or something? Uh, I think you know this, folks. The image on the retina is actually upside down. You all know that, don't you? And the brain, if you will, turns it right side up. Uh, he said, well, you know, it's interesting. He said, if I had walked into a room, blank wall, with two pictures exactly the same, and one is upside down and one is right side up, I maybe couldn't have told you which was which. Somehow, his brain 
altered what was going on to the place where it was perfectly natural for him to function in an upside down left or right way. So did he have to go through a, a series of time to get back to That's a very good question. I'm getting to that. Thank you for thinking ahead of me like that. Um, so the day came, after six weeks, they were going to, okay, everything, we know what we want to know. And uh, they took that thing off. And these are his exact words. I think I would never forget them. He said to me, took these off. He said, in 30 seconds, I was a bumbling idiot. <laughs> now, if you think about it, uh, what he had here was kind of tunnel vision. Y'all with me on that? Yes. And that portion, the brain, if you will, fixed. But the rest of it was still the same as before. And when he had both images, it made him crazy. What did he call himself? A bumbling doctors, there was a couple of them there, they realized there might be some issues. They grabbed him and rushed him into a dark room, laid him down on a bed. It took six weeks for, except he would wear a mask. They would raise the light in that room just a tiny bit from pure darkness. And finally, he was okay. <laughs> now, before I give you my last story, let me just make clear what's going on here. The rest of our presentations this weekend are going to be on how you can stay well or get well, even uh, in view of pandemics. Um, and most of you in this room probably are practicing better health habits than most of the people in the world. Is that correct? <laughs> Most of you should be, is that correct? <laughs> and um, I think you will be surprised that there, there are some things that you need to know that you probably know. I'm going to be dealing with the biggest killer, heart disease. You know that every day in this country, as a result of what we call coronary artery disease. You and I often just say heart disease, and that's what we mean. There are hundreds of different things that can happen to the heart that we call heart disease. But I'm talking about coronary artery disease, the plaque that we build up, we all went through. Um, you, would, you could fill seven, 747s full every day. That's how many people are dying in the United States alone from every day from coronary artery disease. That's more than is dying in the pandemic. Dr. John McDougall, one of the most one of the most foremost um, presenters on scientific knowledge about health, says this. Listen carefully. 100% of coronary artery disease is preventable. How much? All of it. Most of you in this room do not understand how or why I'm going to teach that to you. You need to know it, no matter what your age is, in my opinion. Um, then he goes on to say, and 100% of it is reversible. Our neighbor, just down the road from where we live, called Neva, she and Neva are close friends. I, we're, we're, we're both friends with her, with her and her husband. Um, and said, the doctor just told me that I'm within 1% of having to have bypass surgery. So, uh, could she change that percentage? According to what I just quoted to you from John McDougall? 
and I could give you a host of other physicians that would say the same thing. Um, I want you to understand for more than you do perhaps right now on that issue. I'm also going to deal with the second largest killer. If you take all cancers, all cancer deaths, you come very close, and in fact in some areas it's actually exceeding the total deaths per day of heart disease or coronary heart disease. You can look at both of those things. Um, and it'll probably be, um, I'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Try to just make it practical in what you can do, what's causing the problems and so forth. And why did I do this thing today? I wanted to do something that had some spiritual implications. To just help you be more motivated to take care of what God has given you. Amen? I hope that makes sense to you. Let me tell you the closing story. Mike May, blinded at three years of age um, by an explosion, uh, grew up blind, became an engineer, became famous for inventions, and was remarkable for what he tried to accomplish. He became the fastest blind skier in the world. I don't think it tells you this there, but uh, he, his record is 60 miles an hour uh, line. I'm afraid to go 30 miles an hour. <laughs> I'll never forget when I first started teaching at UCA, I really take the kids skiing on the weekend, on Sunday. And uh, one of my students, it was a female, we somehow rode up the chair together. We started down the hill. She would, she was gone like a blind flash. And I'm up there trying to get down the hill. Anyway, um, not that long ago, uh, his ophthalmologist said to him, "There is a stem cell treatment that's been discovered that could possibly give you some vision back in one of your eyes." Would you be interested? Now that's not a trivial question. If you think about this, um, do you know that uh, Fanny Crosby, uh, who interestingly enough for some of you that know about this, was born the same year and died the same year that Ellen White was born and died, and wrote over nine thousand hymns. No one has come close to that. Well. Wesley uh, uh, wrote, was it John, wrote uh, something like 6,000. But no one has come close to Fanny's record. You know that, I'm sorry, dear? Charles, thank you, sweetheart. When I said John, I thought that's the preacher, that's not the musician. But uh, anyway, you know what she said before she died? She said, if I had to do over again, I would choose to be blind. I suppose, folks, blindness made her more prolific at just thinking than some of us, than all of us who have our vision. So I use that to simply say that to, uh, to him and his wife, Mike May and his wife, this was not a trivial question. He's a scientist, he's an engineer, he was, became famous as an inventor, blind. Um, Aside from his skiing issues. So uh, he and his wife talked it over and they decided, yes, why don't we try that? And indeed, he got some vision back, but something that no physician or scientist had ever addressed before, it was unknown, is that a baby, let's say, has to learn to see in a similar way that a baby has to learn to walk or learn to talk. Everybody knows this, the mothers especially, when that little baby is first in your arms, whether it's a few minutes or a few days, 
Um, they don't make eye contact. Their eyes are just kind of wandering around because they there is a process in learning to see. We knew nothing about this before, my friend. And the book, someone gave me this book and I read it, I was just fascinated because the effort to understand why Mike May couldn't see, though he could see, y'all with me, uh, by the technicians as well as the physicians and the scientists, uncovered this very interesting milieu. When a baby is born, by the way, the optic nerve is actually still growing while the baby's born. It is growing back toward the brain, amazingly enough. So that's part of the picture. But besides that, there's about a trillion connections that are already in the baby's brain that have to be selectively undone in order for the baby to learn to see. And about a trillion connections made that are not yet there for the baby to learn to see. You follow what I'm trying to describe? Yeah. We knew nothing of this before. And uh, even today, after 20 years, 22 almost, Mike can still not recognize a face. He can see it, but he can't remember or can't tell who that was. You and I think nothing of that. We, we see somebody, I bumped into somebody here last night. Um, I recognized him from, I don't remember where we ever met, but. Uh, they came over to check out the system. Um, some of you that are older, like I am, if they tried to teach me or you a foreign language, would it be of much success? Would it be agonizing? At least, uh, you know, I can pronounce the word you tell me, but about 10 minutes later, I can't remember it. Do any of you relate to that? So, uh, the point is that um, we have to learn uh, things early in life that we cannot learn later. As much as they have worked with Mike, uh, this whole field of understanding another level of complexity than I have described until just now about how the eye works is being, if you will, elucidated and made more understanding. Now let me make one quick um, uh, application to this. Remember the story in John, John chapter 9 where Jesus comes to this man, the man isn't asking for help. The Bible doesn't even say that Jesus came to him, but the man instead of a woman, and said, uh, the Bible doesn't say, he said, now brother, I'm going to do something with your eye. The Bible says Jesus spit on the ground and made some mud and just pasted it on the man's eye. <laughs> and then he told him to wash. And I love this. If you look at it, it's John chapter 9, verse 7. Oh, I love this. It says he went and washed, and then watch this phrase, and he came seeing. You know, Jesus didn't just fix a lens that was cloudy, or maybe repair a retina that's, or something. He undid a million a trillion connections and made a trillion connections as though that man had learned to see from the time he was a child. Did you get what I'm trying to do? Isn't that amazing? He came see. My desire for you folks is that you will come see. I, of course, am interested in that for us all spiritually. I want you to come see probably at some levels you've never realized before about
about taking care of your body. Are you with me on that? So please be with us and bring your neighbors and friends. I think you'll find it fascinating that I'm going to be here. Uh, and I'm not interested in browbeating anybody. I would like you to know, folks, even as vegetarians, in fact, even as vegans, did you know that you can be a junk food vegan? <laughs> I mean, after all, potato chips and french fries are vegan. People come to me and they say, how come there's so much pancreatic cancer showing up in anthrax? I want to tell you why, friends. So you to understand why. And, uh, you all understand this, folks. It means making some changes, but some of you more, some of you less. The problem with changes is health food tastes terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it's tongue-in-cheek, obviously. Uh, Neva, my precious friend and wife, God has blessed this woman. When we were married, she, you asked her if she did not know how to cook. <laughs> And God has blessed her. Uh, she doesn't like me to say this, but it's true. Neva is without a peer in making healthy food taste good. I don't know how many classes we have done, folks. 10, 20, 1,000 classes all over this world. She was the food service director for 10 years in, in uh, Seattle. We opened two restaurants. And um, we serve this kind of food uh, that, that we're talking about. And of course, there's other issues besides food. Food is the biggest thing. Activity is an issue, as you know. Anyway, I want to deal with this with you. And I just hope that you'll be impressed that it will be worth your time to give some more thought to a field that you've probably all given a lot of thought to. But maybe there's some things that there are still things that you can learn. But the point about Neva was that this Dear woman knows how to make healthy food taste fabulous, folks. Isn't it true? How many of you know about that and would agree with that? She's the author of three um, whole plant books. And uh, God has blessed her. I'm uh, the most fortunate man in the world. Um, I thank God for that. Let's pray. Father, we're very moved by your creative hand. Probably all of us appreciate dimly what you really have done in making us us. But we are moved to realize what you have given us physically. We know you want us to take care of it. It has spiritual implications, Lord. Bless this congregation. Bless our friends from the community. That we can make progress, Lord. In doing things for our body that you would have us do. And we thank you for promising to help us. We thank you for being patient with us. Oh, Lord, I, I personally thank you for your patience. And your mercy. Bless these people. Bless us all. I want you to sing with me number 111. My father is omnipotent.